Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. The science fiction follow our scientific pursuit and discoveries, or is it the other way around? Now, I believe it's a bit of both because human creativity goes hand in hand with our desire to explore and find new things and understand the galaxy around us. So what does science fiction say, then, about humanity's conquest of our own satellite, the Moon? And it's the closest and most obvious waypoint for our journey to dominating our own solar system, and eventually the rest of the galaxy. Death to the Xenos. So a bit of background on the Moon. It's the only place that humans have stepped foot on in our solar system outside of our flat disk world. Now some might say we have colonized the Moon, but they're only acknowledging the hidden Nazi Fourth Reich base on the dark side of the Moon. Also, believe it or not, 10% of Americans actually don't believe the moon landings happened, despite the fact that 400,000 people were involved in putting Neil Armstrong and Buzz Lightyear on the moon and no one has become a whistleblower. Then there are also the moon rocks that we took back and the mirrors and trash we left there that you can still see to this day with a very powerful telescope. Another interesting fact is a YouGov poll recently found out that only 89% of Americans believe that the world is round 4% believe it's a flat disk thing, and then 7% said other, which I can only assume means that they believe that the world is shaped in a different way, maybe a cube or a pyramid. Very interesting. What I really want to know, though, is are there people who believe the world is flat, but also believe in the moon landing at the same time? I also really like Eddie Bravo's theory that there is no space or moon. I think that's something we should take a look at. Okay, honestly, this is not really background information about the moon. It's more like crazy stuff that people believe about the moon. So let's just go right into the science fiction uh, and see what, how science fiction views our future moon colonization. In expanse, the prediction for moon colonization is that we will do it sometime in the early 21st century, which is right now. As humanity conquers the rest of our solar system, a belter subspecies evolves with creepy bone spurs and elongated bodies. This is because these individuals are born in zero-g and have never adapted to gravity. And so our low-gravity satellite, the Moon, becomes an ideal meeting place for normal human beings and the weird belters. Even Martians have some problem with walking on Earth, so the Moon has become sort of a meeting place for the entire solar system. The Moon is controlled by the Earth-governed United Nations faction. Now, ironically, due to the intense solar radiation, micrometeors, lack of atmosphere, it's also one of the more difficult places to live in the galaxy, which is why all of Luna's habitats and infrastructure are located underground. There are, however, viewing points all across the city, and the main settlement on the Moon level city can actually be seen from space at nighttime. It's quite beautiful. Lovell City has all of the facilities that a Terran city would have on Earth, including commercial centers, office complexes, tourist areas, residential areas, and tunnel systems with trams to connect it all. Lovell City is also home to New Hague, which is where the United Nations complex is located. New Hague is also where a lot of early scientific research was carried out in the early days of moon colonization. This is also where the first broad array telescope was built on the moon. Scientists could use it to gaze at the stars free from any obstruction from Earth's atmosphere. Lovell City is named after astronaut James Lovell Jr., commander of the Apollo 13 mission, which encountered serious problems with its cryogenic oxygen system. Miraculously, Lovell and his crew were able to make it back safely after improvising a solution with the help of ground control. One could say that James Lovell Jr. displayed some very belter-like qualities in improvising his way out of danger. Now, what is interesting is the fact that this city is named after him. It kind of shows us the president that most things on the moon will probably one day be named after astronauts, scientists, Nazi war criminal scientists, and dogs who were responsible for our early space programs. In the universe of Ad Astra, we are once again placed in the near future of humanity. Travel to the moon is now commercialized, and they use multi-stage rocket boosters quite similar to the ones we have here now on Earth to reach the moon. And it also costs $125 for a pillow and blanket pack while on the flight. That's either because it's insanely expensive to still leave orbit, or the crazy inflation we're seeing today will continue to grow and grow until very terrible flight pillows will cost $125. When landing, a sort of lunar module detaches from the spacecraft and lands in a very airport-like terminal. The lunar complex is massive and sheltered in a crater and like in the expanse, mostly underground. 
Our protagonist, Major Brad Pitt, observes bitterly how commercialized everything has become in this international safe zone. You can see many of Earth's corporations being represented in the arrival halls, including DHL, which I'm guessing handles shipping in the region. Also, like in the Expanse, we see subway tunnels that service the various areas of the complex. Now, U.S. Spacecom, our space military force, has a secretive base on the far side of the moon for launches deeper into our solar system. However, the journey there, which is done on rovers, goes through uncontrolled areas. You see, most of the moon is treated like international waters, except it's even less regulated and far more dangerous. And so you have independent mining operations scattered all across the surface of Luna, and there are even bands of pirates and scavengers murdering and pillaging like it's the Dark Ages. I guess in order to prevent the territorial battles like we see here on Earth, the nations of Earth have invited complete anarchy and a complete lack of governance to the moon. Shabalabia! Now, in a video about the moon, we of course have to talk about the highly underappreciated and underrated movie, Moon. The movie takes place in the near future. A company called Lunar Industries has built a facility on the far side of the moon known as Sarang Station in order to mine helium-3 from lunar soil. This is a great alternative for fossil fuels, especially after an oil crisis hits Earth hard. For some of our younger audiences out there, the major concern about fossil fuels a few decades ago was the fact that Earth's reserves were running out. Fortunately, thanks to new surveying and drilling technologies along with alternative energy solutions, this is no longer much of a concern. The issue now is more about the environmental impacts of burning fossil fuels. Now, scientists believe that helium-3 could be a potent fuel for fusion reactors in the near future. This type of nuclear energy produces no radioactive waste and is far more efficient than fossil fuels or fission reactions. The technology for containing such a reaction has so far eluded me along with all the scientists on Earth. The process involves containing a reaction that is hotter than the temperature of the sun here on Earth. Now back to the moon, Strong Station is a pretty lonely place and is highly automated. There's only one single human working alongside an AI to keep the operation running. Once the Helium-3 is mined, it's launched back to Earth. Naturally, a company isolated on the moon lacks oversight and is, let's say, practicing some pretty unethical things without that oversight. So as we can see, just like in the American West, maybe 200 years ago, there are some problems and lack of regulation and jurisdiction as we are colonizing the moon as well. The novel Gunpowder Moon is half science fiction, half geo-lunar political speculation. In Ad Astra, the world governments have just let things go wild on the moon. In The Expanse, we see world governments unite. In Gunpowder Moon, what happens instead is the space race that we launched here on Earth continues onto the moon, with very tragic results. Like in the movie Moon, Helium-3 is a very desirable resource. It's 2072 on Earth, and global warming has caused an event known as the Thermal Maximum, and that has drastically changed our atmosphere for the worse. And so, Helium-3 now is an essential energy source for the survival of humanity. China, US, Russia, and a few other minor nations have all established mining outposts during the space and resource race. And the characters that inhabit these mining outposts are very familiar. The average person working on the moon are just working stiffs and soldiers who are there to just do a job and are focused on trying to stay alive in a very hostile environment. But then we have these very hyper-nationalistic, gung-ho individuals who believe in this zero-sum gain where if another faction loses or is destroyed, that will be their faction's positive gain. Of course, this is kind of ludicrous when you're on the moon where everyone is trying to fight for survival. Now, luckily, the miners in the Chinese and American base have already established some kind of friendly communication and bond. They even exchange gifts and emails because, well, they're pretty much isolated up there. Isolation on such a dangerous and remote area of the solar system has allowed workers from both nations to appreciate the humanity of their foreign colleagues. And in case of an emergency, the miners know that the only people they can really depend on are the other miners from the other countries. Unfortunately, political strife explodes, followed by railguns and missiles that also explode, killing a massive amount of people. This is a huge tragedy, once again driven by individuals desiring power and willing to sacrifice the lives of innocents and progress for it. 
Now, this is very much a cautionary tale that explains to us that the majority of humans are good in nature and that we have to collectively watch out for the psychopaths among us who really are only focused on gaining power and using that power to destroy other factions so that they can gain even more power. Because if we do travel to the moon one day, we should definitely travel with a humanity first mentality because there's no air up there, there's hardly any liquid water, and there's definitely no food. So, yeah. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed our analysis of science fiction's analysis of our future moon colonization. Let me know in the comment section below what you think, and also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below because uh, we might do another video maybe about how science fiction looks at Mars. Probably also have to talk about Elon Musk in that video. Anyway guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.